a month. Good morning. How's everybody doing? I, I know that you're thinking, that's not Pastor Charles. But he looks kind of like him for some reason. <laughs> um, so we're taking a, a, a little week break from our newly began study of Revelation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, to dive into something that the Lord has been, I guess, kind of brewing in my life and in my heart for um, a good amount of time now. Um, I've spent the last three months, probably, um, in the creation account, um, and so I'm not going to bore you with all of that, but um, it is, I, I found something that, uh, along with stuff that I've uh, studied in the last semester and whatnot, uh, that I think is uh, pretty incredible um, and something that is a message that we all need to hear on a daily basis. Um, so really, I'm here this morning just to talk to you about Jesus, um, and we're going to kind of trace um, this Messiah that's promised from the beginning of Scripture um, all the way through. Um, so we're going to be traversing the Bible um, and hitting a lot of Scripture um, that's key. Um, so if you give me grace to stay with me um, as we go through this, I promise there's a point. Um, and it, it should be pretty awesome. So let's pray. God... We breathe you in right now, Father. Um, we ask for your spirit to give us uh, ears to hear and eyes to see your glory. And uh, Father, I ask that you would uh, protect the words as they come out of my mouth, God, because as I, I preach and teach the word, Father, I'm held um, to a higher standard. I'm, I'm, I'm held more accountable um, to you for what is said um, to your flock, Father. Um, so I ask for, for protection here, God. And I pray that... Um, that our purpose would be accomplished this morning, Father, that we would worship. That's what we were created for, and that's what we're here in this room to do. That's what we're here uh, and on our daily lives to do, is that's to worship you, Father. And everything else flows from that. So, God, I pray that um, from the words that you speak through me this morning, God, that we would just worship, that I would uh, get out of the way, Father, and instead of seeing um, a kid on stage, they would see you, Father. That's my desire this morning. That's my heart. Um, that you would be seen, Father, and that you would be glorified. Um, so we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you will open with me to Genesis 3.15, is where we're going to start our roller coaster ride through Scripture this morning. Genesis 3.15 is uh, what is known as the Proto-Evangelion, or the first gospel. It's the first time that we hear um, of this promised Messiah. Um, and in Genesis 3.15 it says, And it is enmity that I will set between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. He's cursing the serpent after the fall of Adam and Eve and when sin um, entered the world. Um, and this verse in the context of, of the Torah, or the first five books of the Bible, or Moses' book, the Pentateuch, whatever you want to call it, um, and the rest of the Bible is God's promise um, to humanity that a seed— or, or an offspring would come in, in the end of days, as Moses says very often, um, to return humanity back into God's presence. That in God created the heavens and the earth and the garden and place Adam and Eve there where his presence would come to dwell with man and they would exist in harmony. Um, and we fell and therefore God cast us out of this promised land. Um, but to understand kind of where we're at as far as this curse and what's happened in the fall, um, we're going to start right in the beginning. So Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, and, and I would argue that the rest of the Bible is just an explanation and, and a conversation about the implications of this verse. In the beginning, with no one asking him to do it, simply out of his love and out of his desire to be glorified, God created the heavens and the earth um, out of nothing, or ex nihilo would be the fancy term for it. Um, and the heavens and the earth is, is what um, would be, I guess, commonly referred to as a merism. So it signifies all of creation. So just like you, when you would say that you're shivering or you're cold from your head to your toes, you're not just referring simply to your head and your toes, but everything, every part of your body. So in the beginning, God created everything. Um, and Genesis 1, 2, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. Um, the, the Hebrew words here for uh, without form and void is tohu vavohu. And in our English translations, it's, 
I think we miss the meaning of, of what Moses intended here. Um, and instead, I, I really like to read it as um, the earth or the land um, was unfit and of no use. It was, a, it was a wasteland. It was a desert land um, where there was nothing good. And throughout creation, we see God taking this place that's unfit and of no use and creating it into this promised land, this, this very good land, this good land where he places his creation in. Um, and so with every word that God speaks here in the beginning through the six days that he creates and the seventh day where he rests, um, we see that he is good to Adam and Eve with every word. Everything that he does is for the good of man and for the glory of himself. So I think from this, just like how God was good to Adam and every word that he spoke in the beginning of creation, he's very good to us through his word. And that the scripture in the Bible that we hold right here is God's very good word to us um, from beginning to end. And now scripture is this place where God works on the hearts of man to prepare a place for man and God to dwell. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he spoke creation into existence through his spirit in a very good work. And now we have the Bible that is our very good word that God has given us where God and man can dwell together. <clears throat> so the question becomes, if God, this ruler, this, this creator of the heavens and the earth, he's, he has supreme authority over creation, and he created everything. So if there's this God that created everything, is he a good ruler of it? Is he worthy of this praise and of creation? And then absolutely, the, the answer is yes. And, and here's why. So in God's, in six days, made a land by his word and through his spirit for man and wife to worship God. And so this is a place for man and God to dwell together, to walk in the cool of the day, as scripture says, um, providing all that's needed. And then we see, we're jumping ahead a little bit, um, in verse 28, God's command to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply is, in my opinion, our first glimpse into the Great Commission. So Adam and Eve are dwelling in harmony with God, existing in his presence, and God just simply tells them, go and multiply those that are dwelling in my presence. Isn't that our job today? Isn't that what God has asked us to do today? And even in the beginning of creation, in the first chapter of the Bible, we see God giving Adam and Eve this command to go multiply, to go make disciples, to go multiply those people that are in my presence. So God created everything in six days again, and on the seventh day, he rested. And I think that this seventh day is something that we just kind of skip over as, oh, it's the Sabbath. It, but I think there's something even deeper than that. And, and as I really studied this and dug into it, um, God revealed something really cool to me that I think was very profound. Um, but in the first place, it establishes this, this pattern for man to, to rest in the work that God did and that God is doing and that God is going to do in the future. So God worked for six days creating creation, and it was very good. And on the seventh day, he rested. He rested in his creation. And so now we anticipate the future work of God recreating the heavens and the earth, the new heavens and the new earth, where we, we will find our complete rest. And so I think we see here that man's work is only meaningful in the end if it aligns with God's work. Remembering and pr proclaiming what God did do, is doing, and will do. And I think also that what I found was so profound is, is I see here that God, even in his silence on the seventh day, even in his rest on the seventh day, God is still present, and he's still good. So even in God's absence, his silence doesn't mean that he isn't there. So even when we in our daily lives don't hear God, or we feel that God is absent from what we're doing, or, or maybe we're kind of left on, on a edge of a cliff, what do I do? I'm not really sure. I'm not hearing from the Lord. Just because we're experiencing, experiencing his silence doesn't mean that his absence is true. So, God made this place for a man and God to dwell and worship him in the garden um, with a specific command um, that, like it says in Genesis 1, 28, to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So I want to kind of zoom in on this whole idea of subduing creation right now. And we're going to jump ahead to Genesis 3, um, where we see the serpent 
question the word of God. So in Genesis 3.1, he says to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And if you take a step back real quick to chapter 2, verse 17, God's command to Eve was, but of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, you shall, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So the serpent poses this question to Eve and says, so did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And she has the word of God. God has given her this word concerning the matter. He said, don't, don't eat of it. And in chapter 3, verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. She adds a condition. God said, Don't eat of it. And Eve tells the serpent, He said, Don't eat of it and don't even touch it. And so she has this opportunity to subdue the serpent, to just tell the serpent God's word. This is what God said, and therefore subdue the serpent. But instead, she adds a condition. And then we see Satan tempt Eve that we've read and we know about with something that, or two things that she already has. So in verse 3, 5, she sa he says, For God knows that when you eat, eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he's tempting Eve right here with two things that I think that Eve and Adam already have. In the first place, Adam and Eve are already like God. They were created in God's own image, breathed in with the breath of life. And so Satan says, for, the God, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Adam and Eve are already like God. And secondly, they already have wisdom in God's word. He offers them wisdom knowing good and evil, the difference between the two. And so Adam and Eve make this decision, and they choose human wisdom over this divine wisdom. God gave them, simply gave them a command, do not eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And instead, they choose their, their worldly human wisdom over the wisdom of God's word. And so now God responds to this, and, and now the fall of man has happened. And when you first read this, and as I've read it so many times before, it seems like God is, is angry, and now he casts Adam and Eve out of his presence. But the more that I kind of reflected on it and, and dug into this, I really found that God did this out of love and not out of anger um, in, in three ways. Um, the first, um, God is good to Adam and Eve by approaching them first with their sin. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't immediately punish them for sinning in his presence, but instead he approaches them. He asks, he asks Adam, where are you? And now this voice that was at one time this loving voice that they had this relationship, this communion with as they walked with the Lord in the cool of the day, now this voice is a voice of, of conviction because they've sinned. So now God must repair this first sin and all the sins that, have, that follow it in order to repair and restore his creation to its rightful and good order. And so this first good act is he teaches Adam and Eve about their sin. They must learn that they have sinned and how it affects everything else. That now creation will be forever different because of this sin that has taken place. And secondly, God's act of love towards them after they've sinned against him is he sends them out of his presence. And he has to, stu he has to do this because, as, we, as we've read many, many times, and it's a verse that we all know, the wages of sin is death. So God has to send Adam and Eve out of his presence, otherwise he's going to have to destroy them. So this act of love is even though they sinned in his presence, instead of destroying them and ending their lives and in, in creation, he sends them out of, their, out of his presence um, as if to, to preserve mankind so that one day we can be ushered back into the presence of God, so that we, we can be reconciled back to God. And lastly, where we're going to take a, a launching pad off for the rest of our time together, um, he promises a seed. And once again, we're back in Genesis 3.15, and it is enmity, that I will set between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. So here we are. Creation. God created everything in seven days. And now humanity has fallen. And now God, out of his love, 
has promised a seed that would come in the end of days that would bruise the head of the serpent and reverse the sin that entered the world. And so now the, the rest of the Bible hinges upon this very, very important promise because without the promise of the seed, we have no hope in the coming Messiah. So now as we read throughout the rest of Scripture or the rest of the Old Testament, as we get new characters and, and new people introduced, we constantly are asking, is this the seed? Is this, is this the promised one? With each major character, we see them as, as types of Christ, as someone who is a picture of the one to come. So the seed that we've been looking for now since Genesis 3.15, we now learn in Genesis 12, if you'll turn with me there, will come from a man named Abram's family. Genesis 12, 1 through 7. <clears throat> We're going to look at the first three verses first. It says, And the Lord said to Abram, Go yourself from your land and from your family and from the house of your father to a land that I will show you. That's a promise of a land. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will magnify your name, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. In, and in you, all the families on, of the ground, or of the land, the Hebrew word is Eretz there, the same one where God created the heavens and the earth. It's the same word in here, the families of the ground, the families of the Eretz, is of the land, will be blessed. And then down to uh, verse 7. And the Lord appeared to Abram and he said, To your seed I will give this land. So now we see that there is a seed that was promised to Adam and Eve. And down the funnel a little bit more, now we see that this seed will come from the line of Abraham, will come from Abraham's family. So we're going to move forward a little bit into Genesis 15 where we find that God makes a covenant with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 15, 4 through 6, and says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your, your heir. <clears throat> and he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to them, So shall, be, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him, as righteousness. And this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I think this is our scripture almost gives us our first glimpse of, of salvation. And because Moses believed that this seed, this this one person um, being Christ, would usher in a seed of many persons. The language here is dual. It it talks of a seed singular of a, of Jesus Christ and talks of the seed, the, the nation of Israel. And so Moses believed that this one person, this seed, would usher in a, a nation of people, a seed of many people, that Christ would usher in a people with Abraham's faith. And upon seeing this trust that Abraham believed in the promise that God has given him, God counted Abraham as if he was a righteous person. So Abraham, Abraham had hope and faith in the one that was to come. The seed is the one who even at that point, like we talked about today, and we've been talking about so much during this Christmas season, is the one that was, the one that is, and the one that is to come. See, Jesus exists outside of time as the Son, and Abraham had hope and faith in the one that was going to come, and God counted it to him as righteousness. So Abraham was saved by his faith and his promise that his seed, the people of Israel, will live with God in the land that was promised to him through the seed who is Jesus. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So we're going to skip ahead into Exodus. And we're going to find ourselves at Mount Sinai, the next big turning point in Scripture. And let's look at what's happened. So Abraham's seed, Israel, that we were just talking about, seed, plural, um, lived in exile from, from the land after Adam and Eve were cast out. And now they've been in Egypt, and now they're led out of their captivity in, from Egypt into the wilderness, into the desert, um, by a man named Moses. And so in Exodus 19, the chapter begins with the hope, just as Abraham had faith to walk with God, that the people of God now would also. God begins the chapter by expressing his will for his people. 
that they would have a relationship with him just as Abraham did. Here's what he tells Moses earlier in Exodus. Exodus 3, you don't have to turn there. It says, And God said to Moses <clears throat> when he went away to, to worship, he was on Mount Sinai, and God said to him, And I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. This is God's desire. This is God's desire for Moses and the people of Israel that they would worship God on this mountain. But the rest of the chapter, in chapter 19, um, and the rest of the Torah shows why we'll continue to wait for this seed. Israel cannot come into God's presence because the seed Jesus has yet to come. So, Exodus 19, 3 through 13 and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptian, Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, that is important, and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, in a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answer, answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak to you. And may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, and you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. And when the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up the mountain. This is a vital, vital passage in all of Scripture. Because here, God is making a covenant with Israel. That is based on Abraham's faith. We'll look closely at it. In verse 5, God asks them to obey his will. It's the first thing. In verse 6, he says, you'll be a kingdom of priests. Your nation will be a nation of priests. In verse 9, you'll have faith. And in verse 13, you'll meet with God on the mountain. So if you see here, there's no laws of this covenant, just like Abraham's. There's no law codes that we'll see later in this book and in Leviticus. This is just like Abraham. This is a covenant with the people of Israel based simply on faith, that they would trust him, they would be a kingdom of priests, and they would obey his voice, and they would meet with God to worship him. This sounds like the, the salvation and the covenant that we have with God today, doesn't it? That's what we're doing here this morning. So, God calls all the people to be priests. And I thought that this was awesome. So, what's a priest? It's a mediator between man and God, right? It, it, Moses ends up being their, their priest, and, and then the, the line of the, the Levites become the priest for the, the nation of Israel. And they were simply the people that stood in the gap between man and God. And so God is asking for a whole nation of priests. And what he means here is he wants to be in relationship with every person that is in the, the nation of Israel. God is asking the people of Israel to be in relationship with each one of them. That's amazing. Secondly, they should trust God and have faith just like Abraham did. And then lastly, they must go up on the mountain on the third day to be in God's presence. You see what's kind of going on here? However, unfortunately, it's not going to be this third day that God and man would dwell together, would it? It's a different third day where we end up finding reconciliation and dwelling with God because of his grace. So if we skip down to the next part of the, the passage in verse 16. And so it was on the third day when there was morning. And so there were many thunders and lightning strikes and a heavy cloud was upon the mountain. Just like the Lord had promised. 
and the sound of the trumpet was exceedingly loud. So now the trumpet has sounded, and all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought out the people from the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain of Sinai smoked all of it because the Lord came down upon it with fire. And the smoke went up like smoke from the kiln, and all of the mountain trembled exceedingly so. So the third day has happened, the trumpet has sounded, and now it's time for Israel to meet with God. But instead of worshiping, they tremble in fear. Israel is not ready to go up to the mountain into his presence. They cannot stand before God in their sin. So God provides a way for man and God to dwell temporarily together in a covenant with Moses that he gives them until the Messiah, until this seed can come in the end of days. So this covenant that we see with the law codes in, in Exodus and in Leviticus and Numbers keeps Israel close enough to God because God does desire to dwell with man, but it also keeps Israel apart from God so they don't suffer his wrath, so they're not destroyed. And so these law codes and these, these rules and these regulations and these things were not meant to save Israel. They w- weren't meant to fill these things and you will be saved and you will be my people, but instead they were here to direct them in the way that they should go until this seed, until the promised Messiah could come and go up in the mountain on the presence of God on the third day. So now, throughout the rest of the Old Testament, we see Israel trying and failing to obey these laws. And in turn, they incur the wrath of God over and over and over and over again. And we just see a trail of destruction. They're still waiting for this seed of Adam and Eve to go up on this third day and usher in the people into the presence of God, to be back into the presence of God where man and God could dwell together. And so we see continually the prophets and the judges towards the end of the the Old Testament continually cry that there's no king in the land, there's no king that could guide Israel into into the presence of God. Instead, they just keep getting destroyed. So we've hit some major moments in the Old Testament, and we've seen from the beginning in creation, or God created this very good creation, and he's a good father, and that he was good to Adam and Eve, and they walked with him, and they dwelled with him in God's presence. And then man and humanity fell, and God, out of his love, promised them that one day a seed would come to bring them back into the presence of God. So God makes a covenant with Abraham. He attempts to make the same covenant with Israel, Instead, he gives them these law codes that carry us through. So where's the seed? Where's where's the promised Messiah? Where is this person, this Jesus, that we've been so waiting for, that people, that the prophets are crying out about, that he is coming? Let's find out. In the New Testament, Matthew 1, 21 through 23, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And then in Luke 1, 30 through 33, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, Israel, forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, the seed. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
And then the proclamation of the Messiah in John 1, 29 through 34. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. The seed would be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So this promised Messiah now, God, came in the flesh to earth as a child, so that he might bear the sins of man. This seed that throughout all of the Old Testament that we continually are asking for and begging for because of our sin, because we can't dwell in the presence of God in its agonizing, has now come in the form of a little baby to bear the sins of man. And so in this ultimate act of love and grace, God came as a baby to be slaughtered. And why? To save the murderers. The seed that would come would die for his people. In Colossians 1, 15 through 17, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Do you see these ties coming together? For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him And for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So everything is made through and by and for Jesus, this seed. Everything is for him. He created it. It's his. But we were wicked, so God sent the person that everything was made for to die for his own creation. This is a scandal of grace. This is the gospel. So Jesus came and changed everything. Everything. He turned the world upside down. Everything that people believed that they hoped for, all of this law and, and garbage that people were dwelling with, Jesus came and wrecked it all. We all know the story. His people were still at the foot of the mountain. Isn't that exactly what Emmanuel means? God with us. We couldn't draw near to God. We couldn't do it on our own. So instead, he came near to us. We deserve death, so he died for us. And just like Israel, we're lost, wandering vagabonds. But instead of having us go up the mountain on our own strength to find him, he came down the mountain to find us. That is the gospel of grace. That's radical love. So in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we see, see the same call as we saw in Genesis 1:28. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There's that same merism in heaven and on earth. All authority in all of creation, from your head to your toes. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you. Always, to the end of the age. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is Jesus saying that he's God. This is a proclamation that he is the creator. All authority. And what does he tell him to do? Go make disciples. I feel like dad's talked about it a few times. I'm not really sure, though. He says, go and multiply those that dwell in God's presence. Just like the command that's given to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1. The start of all creation, the point, is worship and multiplying those that are going to worship him. This is creation now being restored. He gave the command to go and multiply. Humanity fell. Now he has come and made a way for man to dwell with God, and he gives the same command, the point that we're made for. Go make disciples. Go multiply those that are going to worship me. So this is where we're at today. Dwelling in God's presence. That's our purpose. That's what we're doing here right now. 
to dwell in God's presence and multiply it until he comes again as the conquering king. So we have no essence. We have no hope. We have nothing outside of that. God made a way for us to be with him. Now all we have is worship. All we have to do is worship. And everything else is going to flow from that. When our hearts are in a posture of worship, stuff changes. And we're changed. And so in that way, missions don't have to become our idol. Because they so often can. And I know in my life I'm a doer. I want to do things. I want to get stuff done. And I feel like I, since I have this call on my life, I, I got to go do stuff. But the funny, really cool thing is, is that missions only exist because worship doesn't. We have a call on our lives to go and evangelize the nations, to go preach the gospel to people who have never heard it. Why? So that God can be worshipped by them. So that's what it comes down to. Worship in the presence of God. That's what all creation is screaming. That's what all of scripture is screaming from beginning to end is us in the presence of God, worshiping him. So it should be, then, worship and worship alone that fuels our ministry. And I and Dad and, and the elders could sit here all day until we're blue in the face trying to motivate the church to go do something. But it's useless because there's no true love behind that. It's just only guilt due to, to obligation and bondage if we're not doing it out of love. But, so instead, I, what, I'm, what I'm begging and what I'm pleading and I want, what, what I advocate advocate the church to do is just fall in love with Jesus and to learn about who God is. And when we understand who God is and in turn who we are not, we actually do something about what we believe because what we believe is now a reality. So when we fall in love with this Messiah, with this seed who gave up everything for us, and we understand who this creator of the universe is that spoke creation out of nothing and was good to us, When we understand that, and that is a reality in our heart, then we just go tell people, man. We were actually talking about this last night. It's like, when you first started dating your wife or your husband, or for me, I just started dating someone, and dad makes fun of me all the time. But you use every means of communication to talk to them. It's all you think about. It's all you do. And you just tell people about it. And you want to talk about it. And you want to be there. You want to communicate. You want to be constantly talking and having a conversation and getting to know this person. Is that what our relationship with Christ should look like? Because when you're in love with someone, when you understand who they are, when you understand what it is they're made of and what they've done, then it motivates you to go do something about it. So let's get back to the text and, and see how all of this ends. Revelation 21. It's probably my, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, check this out, this is cool. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them as their God. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Wow. Does that sound familiar? God making all things new. The king, this Messiah, has now returned as the conquering king, and he is recreating everything. Now, forever, the dwelling place of God is with man, as it was intended from the first sentence of the Bible. So this is God closing the curtain on all of history. 
the end things will be like the first things. The former things have passed away, and they just pointed to what was going to happen. So see, from this whole time, from the fall until this moment where the new heavens and the new earth are now here, and now the dwelling place with God is with man, all creation has been crying for eternity to be back in the garden, to walk with the Lord in the cool of the day, the tree of life, eternal life. Dwelling with God for eternity through his son, the tree of life. The whole narrative of history is us returning to the good and promised land that God made for his people to dwell with him in his presence forever. So this isn't complicated. It's pretty simple. The gospel is a simple thing. And I'm only here talking because I just want you to love Jesus. And then... When we're at that point, when every day is a new adventure, and we step back and we watch as God changes our desires and our hearts and makes us like his son. And then we just fall in line with his will, and we watch people's lives change. And since the beginning of time, we've been waiting once again on this seed, on this Messiah, and nothing was right without him. Once we fell creation was in turmoil. We were lost and wandering, begging to be in the presence of God, but we couldn't. But now, now we have him. The seed has come. The Messiah has come. We just celebrated Christmas. Jesus is here. So why do we concern ourselves with anything else? The gospel is the central focus of all of scripture. Moses wrote to you, The Bible was written to you, and it was written to you about Jesus. So the coming coming of the Messiah was the climax of all of history. That is the turning point, the focal point of everything that has ever existed. And this book, this book tells us about him. Everything we need to know for life and godliness is here in this book. God's given it to us, this very good word. Just like God gave good words to Adam and Eve, showed his love for them. He's given us this really, really good word from beginning to end that tells us about Jesus. So I just want you to read the book. To have an honest communion with God. To fall in love with Jesus and worship in the presence of God. I want you to intimately know Jesus. And everything else falls into place when we just simply concern ourselves with the gospel and how it applies to us on a daily basis. Because the gospel isn't just this tool that we get unbelievers and people who are unchurched and the lost into church. It's not just this magic tool that gets them saved and now we're good. No, the gospel is just as relevant for believers every day as it is for unbelievers. It is the lifeblood of our lives. Christ came to to set us free. So we just stop living in captivity. And we have so much work to do. We really do. There's nations that are unreached. There's people who have never heard the word of God. That's reality. But what good is all that labor if it's done out of spite or obligation? It's empty. It's fruitless. So it starts with this starts with waking up every morning and preaching the gospel to yourself. Meditating on who you're not and instead who God is. Because it's not just unbelievers that need it. We need it every day just as much as they do. Because we're the same sinners that they are. And just like Israel, every day we're just waiting at the foot of the mountain. And God's given us the word to say, hey, dwell in the presence of God with me. It's applicable to every situation, to every circumstance, to every day, to every moment. The gospel is relevant. Jesus is relevant. This promise of the Messiah, of this coming seed, and its fulfillment should be our focus in everything. It helps us to respond in the right way, to handle situations correctly, in the way that Jesus would. And so the Christian walk is one of hope, and it's one of joy, and it's one of peace. And yes, there's suffering. Yes, there's hardship. 
But the beauty of the gospel is that even though there's hardship and beauty and or hardship and suffering, is that we have a gospel, we have a word that we even in those moments we can dwell with God in His presence. Because the seed that was promised came to earth and made a way for God's presence to dwell with man. And he saved us. Now we owe him everything. Everything that we have is worship to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you that you made a way for us to dwell with you. And God, we're not perfect. And Lord knows if we were with Israel when they were standing at the foot of the mountain, we would tremble just as much as they did. Because we're full of sin. God, but you stepped out of eternity. You stepped from your throne in heaven and you came down, you humbled yourself to human sinful flesh, God. So that you might live a perfect life and go to the cross and bear the sins of man. It was the ultimate act of you putting your cards on the table and dying for the people that killed you. God, I pray that daily that we would walk in your presence. We would dwell in your presence with you. Because that's as simple as it is, God. That's all you ask of us. Throughout all of Scripture, that's the point. The dwelling place of God would be with man, and now it is. So God, I pray that you would humble our hearts and our minds that we could come into your presence with thanksgiving, Father, and just worship you. So we were made for, Father. So we were created for. You made us from the dust and the ground, and you knit us in our mother's womb, and you knew us before the foundations of the world. And the purpose that you instilled in us was to worship you. For your glory and our good. Because in the presence of God, people change. So God, I pray, Father, that we would change here in this place, God. That we would not leave this place unchanged. And we would learn to love you more, God. Father, I pray you would pour out your grace, and your mercy, and your love on us. And we would live on our faces in your presence. Because you are a holy God. And you're worthy to be praised. So God, let everything else fall away. God, as we seek first your kingdom and everything else is added to us. We love you, Jesus. The seed, the promised Messiah. From the third chapter, the word that you've given us all the way to the end. You're the focus. You're the, you're the point. So God, I pray that just as you're the point of God's perfect, holy, and inspired word, God, that you would be the point of our life. Worshiping you, walking hand in hand, step by step with the Messiah of the world would be our focus and our climax, Father, and the, the turning point in our lives and the purpose by which we wake up every morning. Thank you, Jesus. And in your precious, holy, perfect, powerful, and wonderful name, I pray.